Will there be a winner in the new space race? Just days after a Russian attempt failed, India lands a historic mission on the moon's south pole. The U.S. has plans to get astronauts to the moon again, and China has some similar goals. So why are major powers competing to leave their prints on the dark side of the moon? I'm Andrea Sankey, and today's newsmaker is the new space race. For decades, the so-called space race was defined between two superpowers, the Soviet Union and the United States. It was racked with animosity and also involved the development of space weapons technology. But that was the Cold War. Fast forward to today and around half a dozen nations, including the US, India, Russia, China and Japan are investing billions of dollars to send spacecraft and astronauts beyond our atmosphere, all in the interest of scientific discovery. But does that discovery warrant the massive budget it commands? And how will these high-risk missions to space affect international relations back on Earth? Here's a look. Sir, we have achieved soft landing on the moon. India is on the moon. This is the moment India landed the first spacecraft on the moon's south pole. It is only the fourth country to achieve a lunar landing after the U.S., the former Soviet Union, and China. This moment is unprecedented. This moment is of developed India's victory. This moment is of new India's victory cry. Thousands of Indians prayed in temples and mosques for a safe landing, and people gathered for viewing parties across the country. I'm feeling the goosebumps, and it's a very happy moment. You can see the energy. It's beyond words. We feel very proud to be Indians today, and it's just a great feeling. Chandrayaan 3's main mission is to hunt for a key resource hidden in the moon's south pole, often called the dark side, because large parts remain in permanent shadow. The rover will spend two weeks collecting images and data of water ice which scientists say could one day possibly support human life and propel future missions to Mars. Science people who are scientists who are working on moon has really shown a lot of interest on the South Pole because ultimately human beings wants to go and create colonies on the moon and then travel beyond. So the best place is something that we are looking for. So South Pole has a potential to, to be that. India is also hoping to make its mark in the space race by capitalizing on a reputation for cost-competitive engineering. The country's space agency has an annual budget of around $1.5 billion, with the Chandrayaan-3 costing only around $75 million. India is also is able to produce and make space systems emissions at a, in a very efficient and cost-effective way. Um, so at least in terms of future exploration and commercial standpoint, uh, definitely will demonstrate the India companies and the supply chain, the value chain can actually offer very valuable uh, uh, contribution to the overall uh, and global space industry. So cooperation, collaboration, partnership probably will be also stimulated by the achievement of uh, this mission. The Indian government says last week's achievement is expected to boost foreign investment in its space industry fivefold over the next decade. But there is big competition from other major powers with deeper pockets. NASA in the US is on track to spend roughly $93 billion on its Artemis moon program in a bid to put people on the South Pole by 2025. China is also planning future missions after making the first ever soft landing on the far side of the moon in 2019. Beijing is believed to have spent $12 billion last year on its space program. Even Russia managed to launch a moonshot despite stringent Western sanctions. Its Lunar 25 crashed into the moon days before India's landing in a setback for Moscow's ambitions. The Kremlin says it will partner with China's moon race but few details of any plans have been disclosed. It's a fact. We are in a space race. And it is true that we better watch out that they don't get a place on the moon under the guise of scientific research. 
and it is not beyond the realm of possibility that, they say, keep out, we are here, this is our territory. A warning to global players eyeing a piece of the expanding space market in the race to unravel the enduring mysteries of the moon. So, gearing up to get the biggest share of what? And is exploring the unknown worth the tremendous cost? Or does it take resources away from the many more pressing challenges we face here on Earth? Well, joining me now to debate that and more are Martin Ward. He is an emeritus professor in the Department of Physics at Durham University and the Temple Chevalier Chair of Astronomy. From Chennai is Niraj Ladia. He is the CEO of Gnoman Astrotech Company. And in Toronto, Chris Gaynor is a space exploration historian and the author of Not Yet Imagined, a study of Hubble Space Telescope operations. Thanks all so much for being with us. Martin, I'll start with you. You know, it's really remarkable that we're talking about a space race again when, you know, we can remember it just fizzling out basically a few decades ago. And not just because the collapse of the Soviet Union, but because, you know, the U.S. actually started cutting budgets to NASA and public enthusiasm for it really kind of just dissipated. So how did we get to this point today, even declaring a new space race entirely? Well, it's a long story, and I'm sure you don't want me to, to go through the entire history. But, well, I think what happened basically was the, uh, the Kennedy speech, land a man on the moon, return him safely to Earth. They won the space race in 1969. And um, there wasn't much of a prize, no cigar for coming second. And that's what the Soviets did. They came second. Uh, they managed to return a sample of the moon robotically, which was quite an achievement. But who cares? We wanted to see the humans dancing about on the moon. So after that, the Apollo program kind of lost its uh, raison d'etre, its reason for happening. And the public kind of lost interest. We've been there. We've done that. And so it didn't fade away completely, of course, but it did lose its momentum to a large degree. Mm. And then later on, of course, we, we got into the um, International Space Station much later. Uh, but the, the whole business of going to space kind of lost its appeal. And I think it, it got resurrected perhaps in the last decade or so when the interest in Mars, not least from the, uh, the non-national agencies, Elon Musk and others, kind of reignited it by the um, the vision of going to Mars and uh, colonizing Mars and so on. So it, it had a new impetus. But what do we mean by a space race? I mean, it's not just two nations. It's certainly more than two. It could be three. It could be four. For example, the, the USA, China, India, right. possi possibly Russia. Possibly half a dozen even. I mean, if, if uh, North oh, Korea yeah. has indicated at times it would like to consider itself some kind of player instead. But let me move because it, we know India is definitely... Uh, part of this equation. So, Niraj, what does India actually want to achieve by being a player in this new space race? So, Andrea, here, when we talk about the space race which we had earlier, back in 1960s and 70s, we had that between the uh, US and the former Soviet Union, but it was more towards understanding, it was due to the Cold War going on, and it was proving uh, one over the other regarding not just the, you know, demonstration of science research, it was winning a race and, you know, more towards space weapons. But right now, what I think is, as a whole, a global community, all the nations which are competing in a space race, as you say, we are towards the benefit of the mankind. So each other's research would be helpful for going ahead in the scientific research of the global community as a whole. For example, if I go with the Indian uh, mission which landed on the moon a few days back and we cannot be much elated, uh, uh, we are really very, very excited for the upcoming uh, space, uh, what do you call, interest in India and that's growing many, many, many folds. So that would accelerate the whole uh, idea of uh, even all the nations around the globe taking part in this space achievements. And that's well, what India wants. It's nice India to hear that because when you hear from the United States, you've heard them trying to say, ah, this is actually a serious competition here and we have to be very careful who's able to actually stake a flag 
on the surface of the moon or wherever else because they're going to take this space. You don't agree? No, see, obviously, if you are uh, saying that they are saying that who puts the flag first, so initially they had done it. Now they have more people, more countries doing along with it. So there would be a sense of competitiveness. Like if I say that Russia actually did a mission just before the Chandrayaan landed. So Russia had launched the Luna 25 and it sadly it could not be, uh, could not reach the surface and it crashed. So that would be taken as another sort of competition that definitely there is some sort of race going on here who does it better than the others? Mm. So obviously now India comes into play, then they are not alone, just, just the two big countries and the Russia or the US or the China. Now with their multiple countries, there's Japan, there's India, and maybe coming days, maybe a new South Asian country would be there. And okay. who knows that? <laughs> Let me ask Chris quickly, because Chris, with you being the historian, you know, when people ask the value of a space program or even the space race today, I mean, would you compare this to the quest to explore and even colonize other continents in centuries past? Is, is that kind of the fervor certain nations are feeling now, and, and is it healthy? Well, there's quite an interesting discussion going on about that. You know, when you look at the origins of the U.S. space program, there's a lot of that. There was, uh, Kennedy talked about the new frontier and things like that. Um, and there are many uh, comparisons made to previous explorers. And of course, now we are in a, in, a, in a period when people are questioning that, you know, questioning the whole project of colonization and things like that. So, um, so I think it's looked at a, a little differently and a bit more critically today than it was back in the 1960s. Mm. Uh, you know, Martin, some say the difference today, though, when I made that uh, comparison with, you know, colonial times and then the mm. race to trying to get across that Atlantic, for example, and, and take land, was that there were identifiable and, you know, profitable resources on other continents. What is there on the moon today and, and elsewhere that will make nations as, as vigilant maybe in claiming space and trying to profit from this? I will certainly answer that and I'm sure others could as well, but there's an elephant in the room here which we might get to. And that is why are we bothering to have human beings in space? Because robots can do it a lot cheaper and if we lose a robot, who cares? It doesn't need life support. And so a lot of this stuff can be done with robots. I mean, it's, uh, it's very good PR to have humans, but anyway, to answer your question, there are rare earth minerals, the sort of things we need for our chips, uh, the computer chips and things on the moon and also on asteroids. And so another element of this is eventually the mining of asteroids. But we're a long, long way off that. And you have to look at the end to end costs of mining asteroids. Mm -hmm. It's all fine to say these these rare earth minerals are on the moon and they're on asteroids, but you've got to get there. You've got to come back. Uh, the, the cost of the uh, infrastructure and everything it's not clear it's going to be very cost effective. The reason of going to the moon, of course, uh, to the South Pole, was because there may be water in deep there, in them there craters, there could be water. And that could be used for, um, for things like um, making rocket fuel and sustaining humans. Right, I mean, but that's, uh, that doesn't actually provide, you know, profit incentive. It only provides some it, sort well, of sustainability. Unless, there are tourists, unless, unless you're Elon Musk and you have tourists uh. who might pay a few a few billion to pop there and have a nice weekend on the moon. But no, probably would have to be minerals. But my personal view is we're half a century or so um, away from that. Okay. So I'm not sure that the, um, the cost effectiveness, if you were a business person, is going to be in the near term. Yeah, and that is the big question. I mean, if that cost effectiveness for the long term can be sustained in, in the meantime, because it is so expensive. And that's, let me come back to Niraj, because India, as you know, of course, is dealing with criticism from inside and, and outside, uh, that a, a country dealing with the kind of poverty that India struggles with um, is, should be, arguably, people are saying, investing more on the challenges on the ground taking care of the people there rather than on a space program. So why do you see so much value in India's achievement here? And do you think it is about more than just prestige? Okay, so I'll first answer your uh, question in one simple line. 
one thing is very, very, everyone will agree, both the panelists also would agree with me. In a simple line, space is the future. Everything related would come up and sum up to space in the upcoming days. If you are not in space, you are left behind. This is first and foremost thing I would like to highlight here. Second thing, if, if you understand science, see, I'm not a man of politics, I'm a man of science. So I understand science. That's if you want to develop, if you want to progress, you have to invest in science, technology, space. There's no other way around. You cannot say that I need to do today, I need to work on something that is on the ground. No, I need to do simultaneously. I need to work on my thing in space and that will benefit my resources, my people, everyone in my country and globally everyone. But some would so say that that's, a, that's a long way for the value to have to trickle down. No, it's already there. It's already there. It's not long way. It's already there. The whole of the satellite industry is already benefiting every person on this planet. Everyone, even if you see all the resources being utilized right now in India, has mostly been connected to satellites. Navigation satellite, the, the satellites which tell you about where are the minerals located, how the topography, how is the temperature, whether you will get the monsoons or not, how much water will you get, everything, everything is related to satellite technology. Pardon me, I'm having a cold here. Okay, so uh, so you need to understand that science and progress go hand in hand. It's nothing about if you understand science properly, if you understand the advancement of technologies, you will never utter these words that how can uh, you know be not having uh, looking towards your own people and you are we are looking towards our own people and that's why we are doing this. Okay, uh, let me. Uh Turn back to Chris, you know, about the, the, the profitability model, because, you know, there were those that argued that the space program, especially weapons development within the space program, helped really bankrupt the Soviet Union uh, and cost its people very dearly. Looking back today, was there a real kind of trade off that they can genuinely say this was worth it? Whatever we invested in space proved of benefit first to our people and then to the rest of, of mankind across the globe? Did it prove to be truly worthy? Well, uh, there, there, there's, a lot, there's a lot of elements to that question. Uh, I, don't I don't really buy the idea that uh, spending on space or, or even on, on the arms necessarily bankrupted the, the uh, the Soviet Union. It certainly did contribute to its uh, problems. Um, it uh, it uh, well, we're back into the prestige, you know, because the, the Soviets uh, had so many uh, successes in the early days of its space program. Mm. It did it did cause people to look at at the model of the of the Soviet Union, and I think it. Uh, gave some of their younger people something to aspire to. Uh, you know, a lot of people argue that that the fall of the uh, Soviet Union had more to do with the price of oil. Um, um, okay, but I mean, it, yeah, but again, when, when you say like what it inspired their people to do, I mean, yes, that's something to be celebrated, I assume, but is it really worth the kind of cost? Uh, let me go back to Martin about this, because there are those now who argue, Martin, that this is actually all being done at the expense of very technologically expensive projects on the planet, for example, that could help us curb climate change, which is a very immediate threat to humanity. And instead, we're looking far beyond that, ignoring the immediate problems uh, that also need billions of dollars in investment. What do you make of that? Do we have our priorities yeah. skewed? Well, I think we have to clearly separate things uh, here because I completely agree with my Indian colleague that having GPS, having Earth resources, satellites, I think India has more of them than any other country um, that can help um, with crops, and can help with mitigating disasters, looking down on the earth is all super valuable. But 
putting people on Mars, it's somewhat less obvious <laughs> what the human benefit of putting people on Mars, unless you think it's um, planet B if we destroy the Earth. But I think that's not a very good argument, really, uh, to, have, um, to have Mars as a spare planet. So I think we should separate this idea of grandiose colonies on the moon and colonies on Mars from super usefulness of space for, for human people looking down and helping them feed themselves and all those things. There are very different elements here. The prestige, of course, is the thing that links this idea of going to Mars, although Elon Musk is not doing it for prestige. He's doing it, I think, for the sort of the future of um, humankind, which is another element. But I don't think we should mix these things up too much. OK, Niraj, your thoughts there? Yeah, definitely. So I would uh, agree and disagree here. So first of all, we, whenever a civilization progresses, it never progresses with the keeping in mind only the present situation. A civilization always progresses if you keep in mind the future. You need to, so obviously, climate change is something that you need to see right now. And there's no, no uh, double thinking that you need to protect your planet Earth first and then think about going to other planets and colonizing it and going ahead, maybe Mars or so. But as already we've just now heard that why not have resources? I don't know how far-fetched I am in the future, but why, if, why not getting resources from other worlds? Let it be moon, let it be Mars, let it be asteroids, he just now had a word that asteroid mining is the next big thing. So our resources, we are already having resources on the Earth that we are already depleting. But maybe in the future, we would be having resources from those asteroids and getting it on the Earth. But if you think about that, you cannot go to the asteroid immediately. You need a roadmap for that. And the roadmap is started. The first thing that you need to start here is reaching the moon. Because moon is going to be kind of a, let's say, how I'll say, a gas station for you. You know, you're going all the way down. You need to have a gas station. You need to fill it up. So there would be need of colonizing, Mar colonizing sorry, my mistake, colonizing moon and then going progressing towards the future of okay. missions. Okay. And that would be benefiting the mankind. So you need to have these two things going together. You cannot just live in the present. You need to think about the future to progress as a human civilization. OK, let me come back to Chris quickly, because we're talking about you know, colonizing the moon, potentially colonizing Mars somewhere in the future, mining asteroids, all these things, again, at huge cost. Uh, and as Martin raised the point, is it going to be cost effective or will we see these nations kind of run out of the impetus necessary to keep up with uh, with the investment that's going to demand to get to those major milestones in space exploration? Well, frankly, I, I don't think a lot of these things are, are going to actually happen unless they do pay off, mm. uh, you know, especially things like, like um, mining asteroids and, uh, and, and things like that. Um, you know, there is that interest out there, uh, but, but it has to pay, uh, because I think there is a limit to what people want to spend on, on space. Uh, uh, and this was right. certainly part of the questions that were raised after the Apollo moon landing. Do we need to spend all that money? And NASA's budget was basically cut in four and has, has never again reach the levels that it did back in the 1960s. Exactly. Um, so, I mean, Martin, and, who, do, who do you see kind of, if, if investment is the question and making this cost effective, Martin, who could mm. potentially pull into the lead and, and maintain and sustain the kind of funding necessary to, again, reach the kind of milestones that have been mentioned here? Well, that's a very interesting question. And I think it comes down to, uh, it's not national agencies, the famous NASA, we haven't mentioned ESA, I better throw that in, the European Space Agency, 22 mm. countries, very big player in space. It's not just them, it's the entrepreneurs, uh, the Blue Origins, the Musks and so on. And they need to make it pay unless they've got their car company that can fund it and it doesn't matter if it's not cost effective. But um, it has to pay for them. And space tourism, I think could pay if there's enough rich people. But uh, making the mining work, I think the infrastructure needed for the mining is 
is huge. And this is why I'm a bit sceptical about that happening in the near term. I mean, there's a lot of um, interesting minerals out there, but they're a long way away. Anyway, uh, I think what it comes down to is also the, the prestige. China and the USA are the big spenders. India's very good. It's, it's coming along. It's doing fantastic things. The first soft landing on the, the pole, fantastic. But it's obviously its budget is far less than China and the United States. And I think there, there could be a prestige, and that could be a rerun of the space race, because would the US president, whoever that might be, allow a Chinese flag to appear on Mars with a human being rather than a, a United States flag? And that doesn't have to be cost effective. Okay. That's back to the good old days, the bad old days. <laughs> the bad old days, okay. War. <laughs> Martin Ward, that will have to be the last word. I'd like to thank all three of my <laughs> panelists so much for being with us on this edition of The Newsmakers and our viewers, of course, for joining us as well. Remember, you can follow us on X and do be sure to subscribe to our YouTube channel. I'm Andrea Sankey. We'll see you next time.